So you're here with us at the Mesa Lab or joining us virtually. Thank you for sharing your time with us today for this Explorer Series lecture, Beyond the Forecast, the Expansive Role of Community Weather Models with Kelly Werner. I am Dr. Abby McCumber, and I am an educator here at the National Science Foundation's National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NSF NCAR. NSF NCAR is a world-leading organization that is dedicated to understanding Earth system science, including our atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all of these systems to society. I am really glad that y'all are joining us today to learn more about how we can learn more about what makes forecasts a little bit more accurate using community weather models. For this event, you will be able to ask Kelly questions following the lecture. And Olia, who is not here but will be here, she will help moderate so we can ensure that we hear from both our in-person and our virtual audience. If you're in person, super easy, just raise your hand. We will give you a microphone and we'll give you time to ask your question. If you are joining us virtually, you can go ahead and ask your questions using the Slido platform. If you're virtual, if you scroll down this web page, you can see the Slido window. Just below you are seeing the live stream video of this event. If you haven't already, go ahead and click on the green join event button, and then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab. This is for all of us, whether in person or online. So Kelly also has a few poll questions, so please go ahead and respond on Slido. If you're here in person, you can use your phone or your laptop to navigate to slido.com and enter the code hashtag Explorer Series. If you're here in person, you can use your phone. It will make it easier. Um, but definitely be sure to join Slido so you can add your thoughts to our word cloud question. What do you think of when you hear the phrase community weather models? Because we will be getting to that really soon. This event is also being recorded and will be available of the, on the NSF NCAR Explorer Series website. With us today, our guest of honor is NSF NCAR scientist Kelly Werner. Kelly Keen Werner is an associate scientist in the Mesoscale and Microscale Meteorology Lab at the NSF NCAR. Her primary role is with the Weather Research and Forecasting Model Development and Community Support Group. As part of this effort, she coordinates and teaches WARF tutorials and provides online support to students and WARF users worldwide. Her work also focuses on developing pre-configured modeling environments on a variety of computing platforms, as well as quantitative content analysis to improve model forecasts for severe weather events. She leads and is a member of a variety of committees that are focused on better organization, communication, and streamlining programs, as well as on promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion across all of NSF NCAR and UCAR. Now, before I turn it over to Kelly, come here, Kelly. Let's just, both of us, check out all of your thoughts on that word cloud. So if Jesse and Joey could share, ooh, what do you think of when you see that phrase? What do we think about those answers, Kelly? <laughs> I, I enjoy the ones like, I don't know, that's why I'm here. Which, to be fair, same. I also want to know what that means. But I love science done together. Yeah, that's pretty close. Yeah. So do we feel like they are ready to learn all about computer, community weather models? Yeah, I think so. Cool. Then I leave them on your hands, Kelly. OK, thank yes. you. OK. <laughs> thank you. And thank you all for being here, for those of you who are in person, and for everyone who is online. I hope that you learn at least something today that makes you happy. OK. Oh, my pointer. Sorry. Um, so when you wake up in the morning and you're wondering what you should wear that day, or if there is a specific event that you have coming up this weekend and you're concerned that it might get canceled due to rain or snow, where do you go to get your weather forecast? Well, this day and age, there are several options available. Back in the day, we had to make sure to tune in to the morning and evening news to get our weather update and or possibly read a local newspaper. And those options are still available and there's still adequate things that you can use. 
but maybe now you also use an online site, or maybe you use your phone's weather app, or maybe you just know someone who always somehow knows the weather. Maybe this is your grandpa, or a friend, or a coworker, and of course they get their information from these other sources. Well, the information that comes that is available on these sources comes from forecast meteorologists. So I'm supposed to warn you all when we have a Slido question coming up after this slide, and this is, oh, no, not yet, not yet. Am I supposed to do that at the end? You're doing great. Okay. <laughs> so after this slide, there will be a Slido question, so just be prepared. Okay, so then where do the forecast meteorologists get their data that they use to provide these forecasts to the nightly news or to update the forecast websites. They primarily get their information from weather models. And these are large computer simulations <laughs> of the future state of the atmosphere. These simulations are run using millions of bits of data, including complex physics, large-scale dynamical equations, topography, radiation, and even things like whether a particular area is primarily vegetation or concrete. All of these components combined together to create a relatively realistic atmospheric environment. Because these and several other factors influence our weather, we need our models to mimic the environment as closely as is computationally possible. So as you can imagine, using all of this data means that we often need, that these simulations often need to run on powerful machines, which is why many scientists use what are known as supercomputers. And this image in the top right here is an example of that. This is NCAR's High Performance Computing System, or HPC, known as Derecho. And it lives in our NCAR campus up in Wyoming. And this campus is fully dedicated to supercomputing. OK, Slido question now. Okay. So the Slido question is, which of these are names for community weather models? And I can see that everyone here seems to be very familiar with MPAS. But Kelly, what do you think about all of the other ones? Based on your knowledge, are all of those also community weather models? Well, to be fair, I actually had to go look this up myself. <laughs> um, I have heard of some of them, like the HER. Uh, and maybe that's the only one I had heard of besides MPAS. So, but actually, all of these are weather models. So I was actually surprised. I did know there were lots of them out there, but I wasn't familiar with all the different names. Some of them are, I know one is from Australia, one is from Canada, one is uh, from the European Union. So there are just different agencies out there that have different community models. But you're only going to talk to us about two of them, right? Correct. Okay. Okay, so as you just learned, there are many weather models available but there are actually two that are developed and supported in the mesoscale and microscale meteorology laboratory here at NCAR, and that is the laboratory that I work in. These models are called the WARF model and MPAS. So I will start by talking about WARF, what it is, a little history about its development. WARF stands for the Weather Research and Forecasting Model. This is a state-of-the-art atmospheric modeling system that's designed for both meteorological research and numerical weather prediction or forecasting. So I first would like to talk about the forecasting component, and I'll start by defining a meteorological forecast, which is an assessment of the future state of the atmosphere. Now that's a pretty vague definition, right? Future here means basically any time after now. So this can be the near future, so this can be a weather forecast uh, for the next few days or maybe throughout the next week. And this is what forecasting agencies like the National Weather Service issue. They use weather models to assist them with what's called real-time or operational forecasts. They also can be issued for the far future. So this could be over the course of many, many years. And these are called climate forecasts. And WARF is also capable of running simulations for these forecasts. WARF's research component allows for all kinds of other studies. For example, case studies. And these are sometimes referred to as hindcasting. 
These are used by scientists to study past events or phenomena. This allows scientists to dive deeper, get a closer look using higher resolution, which can help them to learn more about it, why it may be happening, and all the individual ingredients that come together to create the phenomena. This ultimately can improve future forecasts and expand the field of meteorology. These images here on the right are just kind of a snapshot of what this may look like. The top image is a radar observation of an actual event. And the bottom image is produced from a WARF simulation. And while these are not identical, the model actually does a pretty good job and gets close enough to allow scientists to study it in more detail. Some meteorologists also run model simulations to figure out ways to improve the model skills so that in the future the forecast can be even better or the research can be improved. They do this by modifying the code. They go in and add new capabilities and improve things like physics equations, for example. They then do extensive testing with the modified code to make sure that it performs well in a variety of scenarios. Often, teachers and professors use these models to teach science classes or college meteorology courses. And this can help the students to better understand the atmosphere and give them hands-on experience in model simulations. So, warning, you have a Slido question coming after this slide. Okay, so a little history about the development of the WARF model. Code development began way back in 1996, back when I was still in high school. Um, this was a collaborative effort between seven different agencies. NSF NCAR, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the National Center for Environmental Prediction, the US Air Force, FAA, US Navy, and the University of Oklahoma. So different groups from each of these agencies consisting of scientists and software engineers all worked together to build this complex modeling system. And this took quite a while because it takes a while to build a modeling system. The first version was finally released in December of 2000. And this version was pretty basic. It was just a little bit more than bare bones. But every year since then, there have been more code releases that include more and more features and capabilities and the code has been refined. And in just a few weeks, we are going to be releasing our next version, which is 4.6.0. Okay, the next Slido question. So we just wanted to ask you to think about how many countries around the world do you think we're using WARF as of this year? Ooh. Answers are still coming, which is exciting. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer, but I want to assume that is more than 50. <laughs> I, I you would be right. Assume. You would be right about that. Yes. yes. What is the answer? Well, I'll wait until the next slide. So okay, so it's answer. a spoiler. Okay, I will, I will <laughs> yeah. hold on. Not long. You don't have to wait long. Just on the next slide. Okay, so over the last uh, nearly 25 years, we, the WARF model has accumulated many, many users. We're inching up towards 70,000 users now. And this is, these users come from 188 different countries. This means that in the entire world, there are only seven countries where we do not have a registered user for the WARF model. Now, this doesn't mean that 70,000 people are actively using the WARF model every day, since many have moved on to other things or places. But we are still receiving over 4,000 annual registrations, and these come from all over the world. So for everyone who put more than 150, you did a great job. So you've learned a bit about WARF. Now let's switch gears and talk about impasse. MPAS stands for the Model for Prediction Across Scales. So this is our newer model, our next generation modeling system. This model is a combination of the atmosphere, ocean, and various other Earth system components. And even though it's not in the name, like WARF, it, it, it too is designed for forecasting, research purposes, and climate applications. 
Development began on this model back in 2005, and like WARF, it was a collaborative effort only between two agencies this time, NSF NCAR, who developed the atmospheric model, and Los Alamos National Laboratory, which developed the ocean and land ice model. Version one was released in 2013, and just last week, uh, another major release came out, and it was version 8.1.0. So you're probably wondering what is the difference between WARF and Impasse and why do we need two models? Both of these models are highly skilled modeling systems and they both provide relatively accurate results. The primary difference between the two is with the grid or mesh structure. So WARF uses these square or rectangular grid cells and depending on the map projection, these can be anisotropic or they become non-uniform in different directions. And this can sometimes lead to poor scaling with high performance computing systems or HPCs. And as you can see, the grids become tighter and tighter and eventually have to come together to a point at the poles. So this can create computational problems and it can become difficult to do any sort of modeling over the polar regions. Impasse uses unstructured meshes on hexagonal grids. And this tends to scale very well with HPCs. And as you can see, it eliminates, it eliminates any problems that you may have at the poles. You will have a Slido question after this slide. So, oops, not yet. So when running model simulations, it is ideal to use either high or very high resolution, but this can become computationally expensive. So scientists use what is known as grid refinement to scale down to a higher resolution over the area of interest with coarse resolution surrounding it for the remainder of the globe. And this can help to save on cost. WARF's square or rectangular grid uses a concept called nesting. And this is where you nest the high resolution domain inside the coarse resolution. And this typically works okay but it can cause distortion or noise at the boundaries between the two different resolutions. And this sometimes can lead to interruptions in the simulation or rather the model blows up and stops. Impasse is able to handle grid refinement pretty nicely. Um, it smoothly scales down to higher resolution and its grid structure increases its accuracy and flexibility and allows it to be used by next generation hardware and modernized software. So while WARF is still very much used and supported, eventually it will be phased out by MPAS. The current roadblock for this happening is that MPAS doesn't yet contain all the features that WARF possesses. As I mentioned, building a large modeling system takes a really long time. So it's still being developed and they're still adding in those features to, um, until, it gets to, until it has all the abilities of WARF. So right now, scientists, some scientists still need or prefer to use WARF. And once impasse phases WARF out, it doesn't mean that they can no longer use it. They still can use it. It's just that there will no, not be any future development and we will not be available to support it anymore because we will be putting all our support efforts into the impasse model. So let's look at that slider question. Oh. Okay. So who can provide data for community models? And I am glad that people are not saying that it's only scientists because that just goes into understanding that it's a community model. But can anyone just submit data? Or does it depend on the model? Or if do it, you have an answer for us so coming? If it is a community model, then Actually, anyone can. That doesn't mean that we will accept the date, the <laughs> code, but anyone can submit it. So I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Wait. Yes. Okay. So, as you learn, WARF and impasse are what we call community models. And what this means is that this code is free open source code. So anyone is able to obtain the code free of charge. So everyone in this room or everyone online, you are all welcome to go home tonight and download the code if you are so inclined. 
Um, as I mentioned, the initial code development was a collaborative effort between a few different agencies. But since then, collaboration has vastly expanded to groups all around the world. Both of these models welcome modified code and new feature contribution from the community. Now the code must meet specific standards, and this is where that comes in, that you can't just, you know, not everyone can, not everyone's code will be accepted. And not everyone wants to submit code either. Um, the code must meet specific standards and pass a number of performance tests, but the bulk of ongoing development is actually done by various groups outside of NCAR, and we refer to this as the community. After someone shares their code and the code has passed all the tests and it's been committed and included in a release, the support then is primarily provided by NCAR, by our group at NCAR, and we do this in several ways. We manage an online support forum, as is shown in this snapshot here to the right. And this is where users go and they post questions or issues and the members from our group go in and respond to those questions and try to address their issues. A lot of time it involves a lot of troubleshooting of code. We also offer tutorials and this is where students come from around the world and learn how to use the model or in workshops, which are more like a conference where people come and present the research that they've done using our models. And we manage all, all the documentation. So once someone from the community submits their code and it's gone into the model, they can typically be pretty hands-off. Occasionally, we do still have to reach out to the code contributor to ask questions to them um, if there's something that we just absolutely cannot figure out or connect them to a user who may be experiencing issues and it would probably just be better if they talk to the contributor themselves about the problem um, because ultimately they know more about their specific portion of the code better than anyone else. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, we conduct user tutorials. These, we, we have them for both WARF and MPAS. These are typically week-long events where we have anywhere from 60 to 80 students come from all over the world. And then our team gives lectures on the various topics related to the modeling system, such as how to run the model, best practices, the physics parameterizations that are available, the dynamical equations, and post-processing. So we teach them how to create images that are that are very pretty that they can use for presentations or publication. So NCAR hosts two tutorials per year per model. So that's a total of four tutorials. Each model has one in-person tutorial and one virtual tutorial. And the in-person tutorials are held here in Boulder, Colorado. We also often provide one or more tutorials internationally if we are invited by an international agency or university to give a tutorial there. During these tutorials, in addition to the lectures that we give, there is a large chunk of time carved out each day for the students to have hands-on practice running different options with running different options in the model, with instructors available to assist with questions and issues and to offer suggestions to them. And these photos that you see here on the left uh, show students in the computing labs during these practice exercises. Uh, the students are at in the NCAR lab up at the top, and then you can see some students that came to one of our UK tutorials in the picture underneath that. For these exercises, the students are granted access for the entire week, sometimes a little bit before and then sometimes extended afterward, for, to either the NCAR supercomputers or to a pre-configured image on Amazon's cloud platform. They also follow instructions from a website that we put together to cater to each individual tutorial, and there's an example of that on the right. And all of these options make it possible for students and instructors to access these platforms from anywhere in the world. So this allows us to give our tutorials virtually and to travel internationally to give the tutorials. So the images here are just from a few of our international tutorials. And in the bottom right, you can see a list of all the countries that WARF and Impass have given tutorials. Now, I personally have not been to all these places, but some combination of instructors have given tutorials at each country listed and several times to some of these countries. 
It can be a pretty amazing experience traveling internationally to give these tutorials. Although we're, we kind of hit the ground running when we get there, we're exhausted, we're jet lagged, it's still really rewarding to take our knowledge to share with students in other nations while being introduced to their culture at the same time. So now that you know what the models are and how they're developed and supported, let's talk about how they work. And I will not get into the fine details of this because I know that can get very boring and we would also be here all night, maybe all week. So I will leave that out. Before running weather simulations, scientists must do what's called pre-processing, and this is getting set up for a model simulation. They first must obtain initial conditions and boundary conditions, and these are used to initialize the simulation as kind of a first guess. There are several agencies out there that run continuous course resolution global and regional simulations, such as the National Centers for Environmental Prediction, and they share publicly the output from these simulations. And then scientists can use that output, which consists of 3D atmospheric fields, to provide boundary and initial conditions to either the WARF or impasse model. For example, this image here shows global surface temperature from INSEP's global forecasting system, or their GFS model. And the resolution for this output is 0 0.25 degrees, which computes to about 27 kilometers. And we consider this to be pretty coarse resolution. Now what that means is if we took the entire globe and laid it out flat and then divided it up into a grid, each one of those grid cells would be 27 kilometers by 27 kilometers. To put this into perspective, 27 kilometers is about the distance as the crow flies from Denver, Colorado to Nederland, Colorado. And those who live in this area may not consider that to be that great of a distance. You can just easily hop in your car and take a 30 to 40 minute drive up to Nederland but from a meteorolo meteorological perspective, 27 kilometers and the terrain difference between Denver and Nederland can make quite a difference. And just as an example, back in March, we had a pretty significant snowstorm and the official total for Denver was 11 inches and for Nederland was 53 inches. So you can see how this can make such a difference and you wouldn't want a forecast that just kind of lumps this entire area together because it would be very inaccurate. In addition to atmospheric data, we also need information about the Earth. And thanks to geological surveying, we have access to a great deal of information on a variety of fields that we, fields that we consider to be static or not changing, such as land use type, so is this particular area classified as forest or urban or desert, tundra, et cetera? Clay fraction, which is the percentage of clay versus other softer, looser soil. Albedo, which is the fraction of sunlight reflected and soil temperature. And these are just four examples. There are numerous other static fields that we incorporate. And I want to clarify quickly that when I say that these parameters are not changing, I mean that they are not rapidly changing. These data do have to be updated every few decades because we all know that the Earth does change slowly over time. So these values are not valid forever. So once we have the static fields, we can then design our domain over the area of interest. For a simulation, we want to use a much higher resolution than the atmospheric data that we obtained. So that the model will be able to resolve the individual components or of the phenomenon that we're interested in researching. So for this example, I've created a domain over Southeast United States, and I'm requesting a resolution of three kilometers. So the model, when it actually gets to the point of simulating, it's going to interpolate those initial and boundary conditions from 27 by 27 kilometers down to three by three kilometers. We then use a program that interpolates the static fields to the particular domain that we've chosen. And here, just to give you a sense of what, of the difference in resolution, the difference in the output based on the resolution, I'm giving you a side-by-side -side comparison of land use types. So you can see to the left, a resolution of 20 kilometer, 27 kilometer grid spacing versus three kilometer spacing on the right for the same domain. And you can see how much more detail is actually resolved in the higher resolution three kilometer domain. 
And you can probably imagine that ultimately this will help to uh, give us more accurate results in the long run. So after this, we run a program that interpolates the atmospheric data onto that domain that includes the static fields. And then at that point, pre-processing is done and everything is set up and ready to run our model simulation. So one advantage of our modeling systems, in addition to being able to model at a much higher resolution, is that there are many different physical parameterization schemes included. And they're each coded to cater to a different type of simulation or maybe for a specific region in the world. And this is necessary because there are many different physical processes in the atmosphere. And this diagram kind of allows you to see several of these processes and how they work together to influence our weather. For example, we have shortwave radiation that's coming in from the sun, longwave radiation that's emitted back up into the atmosphere, and either of these can be deflected by things like clouds or aerosols. We could have clouds that can produce precipitation in many different forms, like rain or snow or grapple. And there are also chemical components, like aerosols, ozone, and pollutants from the Earth that rise up into the atmosphere. And then we also have to take into consideration the roughness of the land at the surface. So things like mountains and trees, and sometimes even buildings, when there are many buildings in an area, can <coughs> cause friction, which can lead to turbulence. We have a Slido question after this. So when we run the model, we use, a, we use our specified domain with the static fields mapped onto it, along with our 3D initial and boundary conditions from the first guess atmospheric data, combined with those physical parameterizations, along with the built-in large-scale dynamical equations, and it propagates forward in time and provides a forecast or output that is then ready for analysis by scientists. Again here, I'm just showing a comparison of one particular output field. This is surface temperature and what it would look like if we had decided to only run a 27 kilometer resolution uh, grid versus a three kilometer resolution grid. And again, you can see that there are much more detailed results using the higher resolution. Slido. So we have been talking about using the community weather models for looking at weather forecasting, but I think we wanted to know what could be other uses for those weather models from our audience. And looking at cool stuff is right up there. Yeah. <laughs> Attracting events. Where are you looking? Oh, attract. Yes. Like trying to get more events to places and just oh, determining yeah, yes. if it works there. Um, weather prediction, extreme events. Mm -hmm. But yeah, disaster impact mitigation in clouds. So wildfire prediction, yeah. air quality. Will you tell us other uses, Kelly? I will, and I will also tell you about some of those as well. So good job. Okay, so I'm done with the mechanics. We don't have to talk about that anymore. And now I am going to talk about the different ways that the WARF and impasse models can be used. So as you all know by now, it can be used for operational forecasting. And these are just weather forecasts to, that are issued to the public like you and to many other types of industries as well. And you've already seen this image from a previous slide, but this time I want to point out the places around the world where the WARF model is used for real-time forecasting that we know of. So everywhere that you see a yellow dot, this is a different entity. So it could be a private company or a government agency, and they're running the WARF model continuously to create forecasts. As an example of operational forecasting, this image in the top right shows model output of surface temperature in Antarctica. So there's a group at NCAR that's part of an effort that provides twice daily forecasts to the U.S. Antarctic program. And this project uses both WARF and impasse to get its forecast. 
The project was original, originally designed to serve flight forecasters at McMurdo Station, McMurdo Station in Antarctica, and that's what's pictured below. Um, this is an area where there's a lot of scientific research going on in Antarctica. The program, the project has since then expanded to several different programs like exploring extreme polar environment, and it has also assisted in emergency operations that were used to save lives. So this is just an example of how operational forecasting can be used for pretty important purposes. Microphysical processes are commonly studied in the field of meteorology, meaning that they are also commonly simulated in our models. Uh, meteorological and microphysical processes are defined as small-scale processes driving the formation and evolution of cloud and precipitation particles. So this includes all the processes shown here in this cloud graphic, including interactions between gases, water vapors, and aerosols, for example. These interactions take place in various forms, such as evaporation or impaction. For example, aerosols can serve as a nuclei to precipitation particles. Collision coalescence, so due to all the turbulence that's going on inside a cloud, sometimes raindrops or hail may collide with each other and grow in size before they fall down to the ground. And all these processes come together to give us different types of clouds and or, variation, or various forms of precipitation like hail, snow, and rain. And all of these can potentially impact our daily lives. So it's important that scientists learn more about these. We can also use our weather models to study atmospheric chemistry. And there's actually a chemical model that's coupled with WARP, and it's called WARP Chem. And it was actually used to create this image shown here, which shows vertically integrated smoke over the United States, specifically the northern portion of the United States, from wildfires that originated on the West Coast. This model is, this coupled version of, war, a version of WARF is supported by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, but they collaborate very closely with our group at NCAR as well. So there are several chemical components that can alter the state of the atmosphere. For example, dust can be kicked up from extreme dry conditions or droughts. And when this is combined with strong winds, it can create these really large dust storms, like as shown in this image here of, over Phoenix, Arizona. Pollutants such as smoke from wildfires, car exhaust, or even volcanic ash can provide poor air quality conditions. So this picture here of New York City is from the summer of last year, and this is a result of the Canadian wildfires. In, this, in the bottom right here, uh, this is something that many people in this area are familiar with. It's sometimes referred to as the Denver brown cloud. And this is a result of smog from the city being trapped up against the mountains west of Denver. So weather models can help scientists study these types of conditions in great depth. Or they can provide visibility forecasts for things like aviation, or air quality forecasts, which are especially important for those with particular medical conditions such as asthma. Uh, warning that you will have a Slido question after this. So of course, we can also use our models to study the more exciting, severe weather like tornadoes and hurricanes. And after running a simulation, we can use advanced imaging tools such as a software product called Vapor to visualize in 3D the inside of these systems. In this example, you can see 3D or it's a 3D or vertical image of a tornado overlaying a 2D radar reflectivity of the storm system that's producing it. So this allows scientists to break apart the tornado and see the different individual components that come together to create it. In the top right here, you, this is an image of Hurricane Sandy or a simulation of Hurricane Sandy from 2012. And what you're seeing here are air parcel trajectories. So this can help scientists to understand the origin and the motion of these parcels that eventually end up in the storm. And how these parcels can influence the strength of the storm as well as the storm track. 
Here in the bottom right, this is an image of an idealized simulation of a supercell. Sometimes it can be beneficial to remove all the other real life environmental factors like topography and large scale forcings and simply study just the one specific phenomenon that they're interested in. This enables scientists to go in and make minor tweaks to the code, maybe modify variable A or variable B to determine their impacts and the different outcome scenarios. Oh, so we have our last slide or question, which is which of these are examples of weather? And I think this is important to try to differentiate between weather and climate. So we have rain, snow, temperature, changes in humidity, heat waves, changes in the size of clouds, as well as ocean surface temperature. Are some of those climate and not just weather? Uh I wouldn't say that, well, okay, yes. So changes in ocean surface temperature, yes, that is an ingredient for changes in climate, and it can also influence weather. It's not, I wouldn't categorize it as weather, but it can influence the weather. Um, changes in the size of clouds, if, I guess if it's, you know, if a cloud is growing very large and due to a lot of convection and it's becoming a thunderstorm or, yeah, the size of clouds, I guess, is, it, that's the part that's throwing me off a little. It's, <laughs> um, changes in types of clouds maybe could constitute as weather. Um, yeah. But you're going to give us a more straightforward way of differentiating between weather and climate, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Let's do that. So many scientists at NCAR and around the world study climate and how it's changing over time. And our models are able to assist with this by running simulations that can help predict the future climate and aid in research based on past climate. But before we get into that, I do want to take a minute to talk about the difference between weather and climate. Because these words are often used interchangeably and they actually mean very different things. Weather is defined as the short-term conditions of the atmosphere. So this could be today's atmospheric conditions, tomorrow's forecast, and even into next week. Weather can change very rapidly over the course of a couple of days, hours, and sometimes even minutes. For example, if we have a very strong cold front come through, you can feel the temperature drop almost instantly. Climate is defined as the average weather conditions over a long period of time. So this can be from many months to hundreds of years. So just to put this into perspective, let's say that you are planning a trip to Australia sometime next fall, and you want to know what the weather is typically like in September, October, and November. Obviously, this would be our fall. Um, so that you could choose the most ideal time to go. Well, you could look at the climatology for that area for that time period and get an idea of what to expect. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be accurate because this information is based on an average of many years of data. And this year could just be an outlier, but it is a best guess. So in the words of Mark Twain, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. So climate studies are often global, but not always. Many scientists focus their research on specific areas or regions. The two plots here on the left show an average daily maximum temperature for a 10-year period from 1990 to 2000 over North America and South America. And the data that provided these plots was run from multiple simulations that were identical except that each used a different physics or radiation physics scheme. This combination of using several forecasts is called an ensemble, and each individual simulation within that ensemble is called an ensemble member. And it's not uncommon for scientists to use this method to determine different outcome scenarios, or in this case, which radiation scheme would make the most sense for a certain region. So the black line here shows the recorded observation, so this is what actually happened, and the blue and pink uh, lines here represent the different ensemble members from the two different radiation schemes. And you can see that 
it varies a little for North America, but it doesn't make that much of a difference. But it does for South America. So this lets scientists know that when they are modeling something over South America, they probably should choose the blue scheme here, which is actually called RRTMG, but that probably doesn't mean anything to you. The plots to the right are a 55-year forecast from 2005 to 2060. This forecast ran with 40 ensemble members, and it allowed scientists to determine the average temperature trends and the warmest and coolest extremes by the year 2060. So why is climate modeling important? Well, for many reasons that I don't have time to get into all of them, nor do I have the background for that. But some things that you may care about are the fact that increases in temperature can potentially lead to an increase in stronger convective systems or storms. And this may create more extreme conditions in the future, such as high winds, which can come from large systems like hurricanes or smaller isolated thunderstorms, like is shown in this image up here in the top left, which can cause a, something called a microburst or straight line winds which again is pictured in that image. And this can create damage similar to that of a tornado. Flash flooding, which can create sudden dangerous conditions, especially when driving. Increased number of lightning strikes, stronger tornadoes, large hail, which can damage structures and break car and house windows, and landslides, which can result from heavy precipitation and flash flooding. And again, this is just to name a few. One growing area of research deals with the impacts that urbanization has on weather and climate. So due to building materials and chemicals and pollutants released into the air, urban areas create what's called a heat island effect. And this is where the air temperatures in the urban areas are often higher than the surrounding rural areas. This study used the WARF model to study the impacts of energy consumption due to air conditioning on local weather during a five-day heat wave in China. This left image is a schematic that explains this process. So when the air conditioning is run, it releases cool air into the building while pushing waste heat or hot air into the air outside of the building. And this is not a big deal for a single home, but you can imagine a densely populated urban area on a very hot summer day where every home in every large building is running the air conditioning, that is a lot of waste heat released. So now, in addition to the heat coming in from the sun, being absorbed through the walls and the windows and the roofs, now the air surrounding the building is even warmer due to the outflow from the air conditioning. And this adds to that heat that then is absorbed through the walls and the windows. And then that means that the air conditioning must work harder and longer, and this just becomes a cycle. The plot in the middle here shows land use type in a domain over Beijing. The reds and the pinks here are, show a high concentration of residential areas, and the purples show um, commercial and industrial areas. And it's kind of hard to tell from this image, but it's essentially showing that there is a lot of population, a lot of buildings in this very condensed area, which is actually pretty big. The plot in the far right shows, the, shows observations of the monthly mean electric load for different districts in Beijing. And this kind of work is important to energy companies who need to plan for electrical load management, especially during really big heat wave events like this. And it can also be a health concern because the heat released from these air conditionings create a higher ambient air temperature or surrounding air temperature creating worse therm thermal stress on these cities, which the, meaning that the electrical structure may not be able to keep up. And this can ultimately endanger the health and we welfare of its residents. So as we're seeing more wildfires, wildfire forecasting is increasingly important. And those who live in this area and many other areas are unfortunately familiar with the devastating impacts of these wildfires. This is an image of a simulation of the East Troublesome Fire from Grand County, California, or Colorado, from the fall of 2020, where nearly 200,000 acres were burned. It was the second largest wildfire in Colorado history. 
and hundreds of homes and structures were lost in this fire. But using model simulations and visual, visualization of the simulation output, scientists are able to recreate, recreate these events to get a better understanding of the behavior. And during an actual event, they can now use AI that is trained on satellite imagery to update the model initial conditions, such as vegetation where it's dry or brown, where many, where an area where many trees have fallen down, or where many trees, are, there's a large concentration of trees with beetle infestation, because all of these conditions can provide additional fuel to these fires. So then the, they can run the model simulations using these data along with the atmospheric conditions such as temperature, wind direction and speed, and humidity to get estimates about fire spread. And this can be extremely useful, especially for fire response and evacuation purposes. So like the WARF Kim coupled model, there's another coupled system for, with WARF called WARF Hydro. And this focuses on the Earth's water cycle, which is a complex system of water resources such as rivers and oceans, as well as uh, the atmospheric water, water cycle, so precipitations and droughts. This model has been adopted by countries all over the world, shown here in this map to the bottom left, where darker colors indicate higher density of usage. It's important for scientists to understand and predict how these water cycles interact with the complexities of landscape to provide data and information related to water availability, water quality, hazards, and their impacts in both the short and long term. This map to the right shows an output of accumulated precipitation in the shaded colors in the background and stream flow. And this is from the Colorado flood of 2013. So these wharf hydro simulations can supply forecasters and decision makers um, with information regarding locations and timing of rapid river stage increase during flash flood events. And they can incorporate the control effects such as the infrastructure of dams and reservoirs. So these forecasts can also offer life-saving information. Scientists also sometimes run model simulations to collaborate with other types of industries out there, for example, with insurance companies. For this specific study, Ratings agencies and regulators were requiring insurance companies to understand the impact of climate change on their business. So in-car scientists collaborated with these insurers. They created the worst case hurricane scenarios for the current and future climates. They looked at data from a project that simulated atmospheric conditions from 1850 to 2100. They then ran the wharf model to simulate the strongest storms from that project. And then insurance companies were able to plug those wind fields into their loss models and estimate the maximum probable loss. So this can help them plan for the future climate change conditions. So those are just several examples of how our community models are used. There are many applications that I wish I could go into right now, such as for school systems or sporting events. But to summarize, Weather models are used to provide forecasts for the near future weather and long-term climate. The WARF and MPAS models are used all over the world for real-time forecasting and numerous research applications. They're also community models, which means that they are not only free to use, but they're pieced together from different efforts from individual scientists, software engineers, and research teams from around the world, or what we call the community. And finally, in addition to forecasting, the WARF and MPAS models can be used for numerous applications for many different disciplines to provide crucial planning and life-saving information to entities all over the world. Thank you. So let's start by seeing which questions we have in the room. We have a Feel question. free to raise your hand and I'll bring you the mic. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you know if these models are used by the National Weather Service? These two are actually not. They used to, well, 
there are different components. As I mentioned, there's the Wharf Chemistry Model and the Wharf Hydro Model. There was also one called the Wharf Hurricane Model, and it was one component that was used by the National Weather Service. Um, they now are using another model from a different group. It was kind of this big political bid type thing, and I think we ended up pulling out of that bid, so. Years ago, I believe I had a tour here and I saw the supercomputers. Now that our computers have shrunk down to minuscule sizes, is that picture of your supercomputers still valid? It is, actually. So the computer, there have been several different supercomputers here. We have to change them out every five or so years because they become outdated. The ones that were here, um, they're not that much different than the ones, they finally built that entire building up in Wyoming for supercomputing. And it's actually still that large, yes, because it's, they get bigger and bigger. They allow for more and more, they, they allow you to use more and more number of processors and have more memory and more, you know, all that kind of stuff. I thought they could fit into my Apple Watch. <laughs> you can actually, I mean, if you're running a small enough simulation, like I could run it on this computer right here, but I typically log into the supercomputer from this computer and run my simulations. And I know we have another question in the room, but I want to give space to people online. And I'm going to go to Slido. And we have a question from Carl Drews, who says, does MPAS retain the same grid at all the vertical levels, no coarser resolution up in the stratosphere? I do not believe, mm. I'm actually not sure about that. Um, I, I do know a lot more about the Wharf model. I work mostly with that one, and I am part of this team that's transitioning over to MPAS, but I'm still kind of one of the primary supports for the Wharf model. So I don't want to give you the wrong answer. I want to say that the answer is yes, it does still retain that, but I don't want to tell you the wrong answer. You can email me, and I'll get the right answer for you, though. And we had, we had a question in the room from that gentleman. You did have your hand raised, right? Um, <laughs> He's coming. <laughs> what is the uh, code uh, language that's used? So it's kind of embarrassing. Um, we, <laughs> a lot of the code is actually very ancient. So we do still use Fortran code. We still use C and C++. Um, it, it, so when you talk to newer software engineers, they gasp. They can't believe that we still use that. But for things like this, those languages actually still allow us to do the best that, you know, they, they give us the most options. We are transitioning a lot of our stuff to Python, but yeah. A question online as well. Uh, this question is from Marty, um, and they want to know whether older wharf and MPAS forecast data is it available for download. For example, last year's wind prediction grids, solar radiation forecast grids, and etc. So, we have some projects. Every spring, we run an experiment, and it's either run on the wharf model or the MPAS model. And it's run over the course of maybe like six to eight weeks. And we do have those data available to download. Um, but in general, the WARF model or the MPAS model are run by individual scientists or groups for their specific purposes. So it's not, we're not currently running these for operational um, purposes year round. So we don't have all of that data available. But I do want to say that there are probably, you could probably find someone out there that does have the data that you're interested in if you look hard enough or ask around. I don't know if I want to give the mic to you. <laughs> he was being ornery earlier. <laughs> How do you spell that? <laughs> Lots of models and all over the world. Is there an independent third party that grades you to see how well the models have done, or do you grade yourself how accurate you are? We, there's not 
an independent agency that does this, but we do have scientists who they run all these different simulations and compare the different physics schemes and what works best with this or what compare this model to that model. And these are the types of things that we see at our workshops that we have. People come in and they give presentations on the research that they've done using our models. And sometimes those are to compare with other models and how they work. So it's kind of like peer reviewed publications. It's kind of like peer reviewed model assessment as well. Which brings us to Jenna's question, which is why are there so many different weather models? <laughs> uh, I can't say the definite answer for this. My guess would be that, you know, each group that creates a weather model, they have an idea of what they want the, mo the model to look like and that what they think the code should include and the things that should be output and I don't know. I guess everybody kind of wants their own thing and they maybe they're interested in creating something like that for themselves and they don't want to have to de um, re to depend on the support from groups like us. The room. Is there um, a movement to create AI driven community weather models? So a community model that you could use that doesn't have any physics? I don't know how close we are to that yet. I know that there are a lot of people at NCAR that are starting to look at AI and starting to, like I mentioned, um, the AI usage in the fire models, the fire simulation, they can use AI to update the initial conditions and boundary conditions. Um, I don't know a lot about all the work that they're doing, but they're there is definitely a lot of work going on. And I, I don't know if we're there yet, you know, to the point that we can just let it run. I, I don't know, that's kind of scary, but um, <laughs> I, I don't know. We'll see, I guess. Do you know when the MPAS model like fully will come out? <laughs> Uh, so we have a timeline right now. It, well, it's, it's fully out. It's available. People can use it. It just may not have the specific applications that some want to use. It does have a lot, though. It's already ready, and a lot of people are using it. Um, we have a timeline of, I think, within five years, we're going to phase out of war. We have a lot of work to do to get there, though. It's hard to let go of... 70,000 users around the world and tell them we can't support you anymore. That's kind of the biggest issue is the support. And I know we have two questions, I think, in the room still, but I want to ask Mariela's question, which is how can I measure the accuracy of the WARF model? Um, one way to measure the accuracy is to use observations. So if you have observations of what actually happened in real life, um, this is for past events, of course, then you can compare that to what you're seeing in the model and you will, you know, you can see how closely it gets to accuracy. I have a hiking group and there are three of us. One will call up and say, oh, tomorrow's going to be sunny. The next one will say rain at two o'clock and the other one will say rain all day. One uses the Weather Channel, I use Weather Underground, and I don't know what the other one is. How does that happen? <laughs> well, I would have to guess that the one that is the most wrong is probably using the Apple Weather app on their phones. <laughs> um, oh, and the first thing I do every morning is say, Siri, what is the weather today? Yeah, see, that's, that might be the one. It might come weather from... Underground. Yeah, Weather Underground is pretty decent. Um, the apps that are on the Apple and Android phones, they, they're just so basic. And they say things like, oh, the temperature's going to be 27 degrees at 2.15 p.m. And that, that's just too precise. So they probably actually are using some sort of AI to interpolate from some other forecast. And I don't know what they're doing, honestly. I, there are so many times that I'm like, what did you use? And why? Where did you get this information? It's always my phone's app. Well, what you use in the morning when you wake up 
I use weather.gov, which is the National Weather Service. <laughs> New. <laughs> Not yet. So, Bernadette's question online is Can multiple models like Warp Hydro, Warp Cam, and any others come together to create like a super model that can give you all the information at once? Or will that be just too complicated to understand with a snapshot? Um, I don't know if it would be too complicated to understand. I think it would probably be too computationally expensive to run something like that. These models have thousands and hundreds of thousands of lines of code, and this takes a long time to go through. That's why we have to use these supercomputers, and even then, it can still take a really long time to run very high resolution forecasts, especially when you're including physics options that have a lot of different things going on. So I, I just think it would be, you would probably be running a lot more than you actually need. There aren't many people who need they don't need to know everything about every single different part of the earth. Any more questions in the room? Then I get to ask the last question, um, <laughs> which is if there are any other students or anyone else watching this and they want to start a career doing what you do, what advice do you have for them? Well, I would say that if you, if you want to study meteorology in general, I would say there are several, many, many colleges out there that have programs for meteorology or atmospheric science. Um, do a little research, figure out which ones have the best programs. And sometimes it doesn't even need to be the best program. It can be just a really good solid program. My undergrad is from the University of Georgia. And when I graduated, my class of atmospheric scientists was three. So we had a very, very small class and a very, very small program, but it we still got all the information that we needed. Um, to do this specific job, um, I guess wait till I retire. Um, no. <laughs> um, I, you can get, so if you were to go to school for an atmospheric science program, you probably need to get a master's or PhD degree. I have a master's um, and there are many different national labs around the world. There are, or the country, there are jobs available at universities, at forecasting offices. All these different places have so many different options of things that you can do with meteorology. When I first decided I wanted to be a meteorologist, it was after I learned that I did not have to be on TV because I did not want to ever be on TV. So. Once I learned that there were other options, I was like, okay, cool. And now that I'm in this field, I've just learned about so many different options. Um, so yeah, I don't really, oh. It's just. It's like the end of the night at the club. Yes, on a timer. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kelly. Let's give Kelly a hand. Thank so thank you all again for attending this incredible lecture on community weather models. As part of our Explorer series, um, if you want to join a virtual talk, we have one on May 16th. It's going to be completely in Spanish, and it's going to be on how storms all around the world can help, help us safeguard lives here. But if you want to hear about what happens when models go wrong, you can come in on June 26th for an in-person event that is going to be held by May Wong. If you're also interested in more Explorer events, please definitely check out our website for upcoming lectures and conversations, as well as to view recordings of past events. And if you are 18 years or older, please take a moment to fill out our three to five minute anonymous survey to help us better understand the impact of our program and how we can improve our next event. The survey will close again on Monday, April 29th. So let's give Kelly another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.